to the feature match area for round four. Hello and welcome to round four here at Grand Prix Santa Clara Maria Bartholdi in the booth, joined by Jacob Van Lunen. And there is the team that wasn't supposed to be, but is John Rolf, Jacob Negro, and Alan Wu versus Alan Shortledge, Seth Milliken, and Tag O'Higgins. And we're going to kick things off here with modern Jacob Negro versus Seth Milliken. Wow, so it looks like Jacob Negro is playing the most powerful deck in the format. Perhaps not the, you know, the best deck at any given point. Oh, that's a really good card against him. He's playing Red-Blue Storm. Ooh, Storm. And Storm's yeah. kind of having a, what, a little bit of a resurgence lately. Yeah, it's really, really strong right now. Uh, the thing is, is with Gifts Ungiven, the deck can really just go off at any point because it now has Baral, Chief of Compliance, and Goblin Electromancer. So it just, you know, Cast a ton of spells in the same turn, uses uh, Past in Flames, and then cast a ton more spells, and then finish the opponent off with a Grape Shot. Uh, Thalia, Guardian of Throbin, though, this is just about one of the best cards against Storm in a game one yeah. you could possibly imagine. Um, it makes all of Nagro's spells cost additional mana, and Baral cancels that out for what it's worth. <laughs> <laughs> all right, things are back but, to normal uh, here. <laughs> but, uh, it, Negro's deck also doesn't play many ways in which it can interact with the Thalia, so he's going to have to pay three mana, basically, for a Grape Shot to get that Thalia off the table before he can even think about trying to combo off. Eldrazi Displacer is the play there for Seth as well. And if you see a Baral from your opponent, you just immediately have to kill it if possible. Absolutely. And, you know, when you see a Baral, you also know that your opponent is playing the Storm deck. And if you know that, then you know that your goal is to kill them as quickly as possible while protecting that Thalia. Opt here from Jacob Negro using the old art with Hannah Ship's Navigator. Kind of cool. The Displacer in Seth's deck, what uh, traditionally is its role? So it's just kind of a value creature. It does a lot of different things. Um, you know, sometimes you'll see the card being played alongside things that have come into play effects. Uh, in Seth's deck, the, the main come into play effect that he's using it with is Flicker Wisp. Uh, but it's just a really powerful effect in general. The ability to, you know, exile something, protect it from removal, or get a blocker out of the way. Just a really strong card. Leon and Arbiter here from Seth. Locking things down, but uh, we've got a Priority Ritual here from Jacob, followed by Gifts Ungiven. So here, uh, Jacob's spells cost the amount that they're supposed to. <laughs> the Baral and the Thalia are canceling each other out right now. Uh, he's using a Pyretic Ritual to get up to four mana, and then he's going to cast this Gifts. And let's see what he decides to find. I imagine he's going to see what he can get here. But a uh, major problem for him is there's a lean-in Arbiter on the other side of the table. Yeah. So he's just not going to be able to search his library at all. He just discarded a Pyretic Ritual and a Gifts on Given. Not a great place to be for Jacob. Currently, that Ghost Quarter on Seth's side of the table Yikes. also just a strip mine. Wow. <laughs> Well, the Displacer is <laughs> going to jump into the fray here <laughs> for Seth. <laughs> Selfless Spirit. <laughs> the follow-up play. And there again, we see Jacob having to tap two mana to uh, turn off the Arbiter before... Uh, He's able to sacrifice that Scalding Tarn and find himself another land. Feels bad, man. <laughs> yeah, I, he is. He cannot be thrilled because, you know, with that Baral, he could potentially go off through the Thalia. Sure. But if you're discarding a Gifts Ungiven and a Pyretic Ritual and getting absolutely nothing from the deal, it's going to be really, really, really hard to win a game of Magic. Another uh, Lin and Arbiter in hand there for Seth as well. But he's just going to get in there with his creatures and I... <laughs> want to say <laughs> if a second one is joining the fray here. <laughs> Not looking good for Jacob. 
Not at all. As a fellow Jacob, <laughs> I, uh, I worry about his chances in this game. Do you feel a certain kinship to all Jacobs around the world? Um, that's a good question. I never really thought about it. I'll have to think about it a little bit more. Sure, no problem. <laughs> Looks hate like bears doing its thing. Yeah, Jacob, only really one turn left to survive here. So he's going to have to find a way to win on this turn or the game's over. Let's see what he can do. He's leading off here with a Metamorphose. Empty the Warrens is a draw off of that. That's not too shabby. He's going to be able to flood the board and... Uh, the Selfless Spirit is the only evasive creature on Seth's side of the table, so this could give Jacob a few extra turns at the very least. Jacob here continuing to add mana to his mana pool. Yeah, now up to four mana in pool. And the Crucial Storm count, of course. Is Storm, would you say, one of the more difficult decks to play in Modern? Uh, so I think that the process of learning, you know, what you need to do on a particular turn or in a particular situation, uh, it, it is not the normal way you play Magic, and in that way, it's going to be more difficult to learn. But once you learn what you need to do in those situations, m basically every game is pretty linear, so it becomes an easier deck once you have a certain amount of practice. Like, it's it's much easier to master than a different deck, sure. but it's much harder to learn than that deck may have been. So this is a fun little insight from down our feature match area. The uh, team there on the right side of your screen, Shortridge, Shortridge, Milliken, and O'Higgins, they're from San Francisco, not regular GP players. They say they play maybe one a year. They are shocked to be in the feature match area since they were sitting next to Peach Garden Oath and they got called instead of PGO. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it happens. Well, that's 13 creatures on Jacob's side of the table. No cards in his hand, though. And uh, those 13 creatures don't match up particularly well against Seth, so... Able to... Uh Get some blocks in, but as you said, that selfless spirit up there was able to do the job in two turns as Negros is currently sitting at four life. Down to two. Mirror and Crusader is follow up play from Seth. Another opt here from Negro. Oh, he's keeping. He left it on top. Metamorphose. Ooh, okay. Draws. And scoops him up. That is game one to Seth Milliken over Jacob Negro. And Jacob's probably a bit frustrated there because had he held those cards in hand rather than running that uh, Give Sun Given, which he had ritualed into, into the uh, Arbiter on Seth's side of the table, he probably could have won that game. Yeah, absolutely. Let's check in here on our legacy table, Wu versus O'Higgins. Let's take a look at uh, what's going on down there on the battlefield. Wow, I see a Sword of Fire and Ice. Ooh, nice. And when that is connecting, it usually bodes well for the players connecting with it. Recruiter of the Guard currently wearing that sword. Yeah, that's a... a Really cool card. Those of you who have played Vintage Cube online over you know, the last couple weeks have probably had some fun with that card searching for Kiki Jiki and or Pestermite. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> Two ethers and ether vials in play as well for Alan Wu. Flicker Wisp off of a vial is going to flicker that recruiter and let Alan go back into his deck. Find a creature with toughness two or less and put it into his hand. Mm -hmm. 
Canonist in play as well for Wu. Death and Taxes, the name of this deck. Played a little bit with it. Oh, have you? It's a fun one. Yeah, when I was, uh, you know, was taking my first steps into Legacy. I liked it because it involved creatures, and I like creatures. <laughs> and not yeah. a lot of Legacy <laughs> decks really care about creatures. It's a good one, too. Really fun to play. Uh, a lot of options all the time for what you should be doing, especially when you've got a card like Umazawa's Jite in play, which Wu currently has in hand. Bolt here. So Flicker Wisp going to blink the Aether Swarm Cannonist for now. Saving it from removal. A card like Flicker Wisp having a number of different uses in a deck like this one. You can flicker things like your Stoneforge Mystic even if you're feeling spicy. And that's pretty powerful. You get to search up another piece of equipment. Oh, Higgins is playing a really exciting deck. I don't know if, you, if I've seen this deck much in, uh, in Legacy. I've seen people try it in Modern before. Ooh, the Bedlam Reveler deck? Yeah, this is a, uh, this is a deck that's a prowess deck. And I'm, sh I'm sure it's a, you know, something that people are trying. Um, more or less, it's just a blue-red Delver deck, to be honest, though. But uh, the, the card that really shines to me that makes it more of a... Uh, a prowess deck than other decks where you're seeing a Storm Chaser Mage. A card I, I have not seen a lot of in this format. And uh, for O'Higgins, he's probably not thrilled to be playing against a deck like Death and Taxes because a card like Thali is very good against him. He's playing so many cards that cost zero and or one mana. Oh yeah, Storm Chaser Mage. I, was, I couldn't remember it. Flying Haste 1-3 for a blue and a red prowess. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Alan Wu picking up that first game over O'Higgins. Let's check in on standard table A, John Rolf versus Alan Shortledge. You know, Ooh, when I read. when I heard the story of John Rolf was playing the same deck yeah. as the missing teammate, yeah. I assumed, I assumed what it was deck Rolf was playing. This is not the deck I, I assumed made the it was Teamer. For. Yes, absolutely. We've seen a lot of Teamer in the uh, feature match area so far already today from our standard players. So interesting here to see red. How do you like red that might, how, does, how do you feel about red in a, in a field of sort of teamer related decks? It's surprising to me. Uh, there are definitely ways that you could build the red deck where it might have a better uh, energy matchup. I really like that uh, Rolf had Harsh Mentor in the first game. I think that's a, a really nice addition for him. Uh, you could build your red deck much like uh, Ben Stark built his red deck at a more recent standard Grand Prix where you play more deserts. Um, and then your matchup is probably quite good. But uh, I think the general consensus among the pro community is that more traditional Remunap red decks are disadvantaged against the, uh, the most popular versions of energy. All right, there's a look down in our feature match area. You can see our players all currently shuffling up here in round four. Team event here, Team Trios, Standard, Modern, and Legacy. It's been a real treat to be able to see all three of these formats in the same Grand Prix. Which, uh, which format would you be playing if you assembled a team here, Jake? Um, I think I'd want to play Legacy. I don't know if I would end up playing Legacy. I'm probably not sharp enough right now. The sword's just not there. But uh, <laughs> Legacy is definitely the most fun for me. Whenever I'm done playing in a Legacy, I always feel like my brain just has, like, nothing left inside of it. It's yeah. It's my, you know, favorite kind of constructed magic. Legacy definitely uh, is extraordinarily skill testing. And like you mentioned, being sharp pays off so, so, so much in that kind of format. The decisions you make are, they all matter. They're all <laughs> just 
so important to the uh, the to the game at any given point. And one little mistake could cost you the whole thing. All right, we're checking in here on table B. Jacob Negro versus Seth Milliken on Modern again. Back over to Modern. Ether Vial for Seth. And yeah, now if, uh, if, if Seth doesn't have something like Thalia on the following turn and uh, Jacob does have a Baral here, then things can be really, really dangerous for Seth. The thing about this Storm deck is it kind of breaks, uh, you know, one of the, you know, flagship statements of Modern that it's a turn four combo format because this Storm deck is very, very, very capable of winning games as early as the third turn even. And... Uh, it looks like Jacob does not have, you know, the requisite gifts or uh, pass and flames that he would need to act to win on the third turn. But if he draws one off the top of his deck, the game could end here and now when Seth passes the turn. Wow. Just so powerful. You might have noticed when we had our camera down in the feature match area, another team, Ian Spalding, Matt Sperling, and Tom Martell, and they will be our time walk match uh, this next round. So after this... This finishes, we'll be watching them. All right, well, we did have an answer there, Path to Exile. We'll deal with Brawl. I played a versus a Storm deck in Legacy. That one on turn one. <laughs> yeah, in Legacy, the Storm decks are a bit more degenerate. Oh, you know, it was a thing of beauty. I, j I couldn't even be mad. I've never yeah. been, I've never lost on turn one before. Oh, it was your first time? It was my time? first time. Oh, I'm so proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> and it was on stream, too, so everybody got to watch the Oh, that the makes debauchery. it even more exciting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you've lost on turn one in other ways, though, right? Like, your opponents played, like... What do you mean? We're just, like... like they've, like, played, like, Mishra's Workshop, Trinosphere or something, well, and you, okay, like, like, essentially like <laughs> lost, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'm not counting, like, cube or anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> or essential losses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've essentially lost turn one plenty of games by, <laughs> because of the hand I kept. <laughs> well, look at this. Is that a Dryad Militant? It sure is. I believe there's an Oriok champion already on the battlefield here. And uh, that, that is protection from red, so those lightning bolts in Nagaro's hand aren't going to be able to interact with it. And uh, it's also going to do a pretty good job of uh, gaining Seth a bunch of life if uh, Nagaro decides to try to win with a card like Empty the Warrens here in a post border game. All right, we've got a sleight of hand here from Negro. See if we can get things going for the Storm player. And Negro could attempt to just go for it here. Um, it looks like he's not going to, but uh, he could have flipped that past in flames on top and s spun the wheel. He didn't have to, so... I agree with him on not doing it, but... I think he left an empty of the Warrens on top there. How do you know, base level question, mm -hmm. how do you know to go for it if you're playing Storm? So I think it's, it's sometimes matchup dependent in that um, you, uh, when you're playing against a deck that doesn't have uh, cards that interact with your combo, you want to go for it on the turn before they're going to kill you. <laughs> okay, okay. But if they are playing interactive cards, a lot of it has to do with which mana they tap on a particular turn or when you find the right combination of cards. Here he's going off. He found that piece of the puzzle. That's, you know, he hopes that's going to find him all the pieces of the puzzle to this combo. Makes sense. Um, and you can see he's keeping track of uh, the mana he's creating and his storm count over there on those tokens, which is kind of cool. Seth could just write F6 on a piece of paper and drop it on the battlefield. <laughs> yes, he could. Another piece of the puzzle. Finding a double brawl 
We're going to take that Metamorphos and that Lightning Bolt. Yep. Put the rest in the graveyard. Pyrotic Ritual here. Down it goes. Three red mana. Stormcoat seven. It needs to uh, find himself uh, some sort of storm spell that's capable of winning the game. Metamorphose here. Right now, this Empty the Warrens is going to be very, very, very good. Seth will gain a bunch of life, but uh, still, a few attack steps from Nagro should be good enough to end the game. Do all Storm decks play pieces of the puzzle? Um, not all of them, but most at this point okay. do play some number. Most might be aggressive. Some do. <laughs> a non-insignificant amount. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. Storm cone at nine. It's always really interesting to watch the Storm player try and put the pieces together. Just trying to figure out, now how exactly do I make this all work so that I don't just completely dis just destroy myself in the process by accident? So what, uh, what Nagro might be thinking about here is the fact that he might be able to take Grape Shot and Remand together. Uh, he's not going to. But uh, in doing so, he could have gotten his Storm Count up to uh, 10, then cast the first Grape Shot, Remanded the one copy, uh, thus dealing 10 damage, and then cast the other Grape Shot for 12 in dealing exactly 22. Uh, instead, he chooses to uh, go for an Empty the Warrens plan here. And there it is, Empty the Warrens. So it's going to be... 12? Yeah, 24 goblins. Wow. <laughs> 22? No, yeah, there we go. Okay. <laughs> and a foil goblin token, style points. I like it. So you see Seth's life total there. He jumped back up to 46. Pretty high life total there for him. <laughs> That's insane. However, um, 24 oh. goblins on the other side of the table. It doesn't take very long for 24 goblins to, no. to chew away at. Uh, Oriac champion. Getting work done, but might not be enough. I've, so. Oh, another empty. Okay. Wow. 72 life. Oh, modern, everybody. And that's why there you see on your screen, Oriac Champion, why Seth's life total is so very high. Leon and Arbiter in play as well off that Ether Vial. Looks like just two lands in hand for Seth. And he says, that is enough, sir. You've made enough goblins <laughs> that I do not need to see any more. And scoops him up. Uh, Game two 50 there. 50 goblins. Jacob Negro, 50? 50 of them. Those warrens were emptied. They, they did not have many goblins left inside of them. All right, let's check in once again on standard here. Ramunap Red for John Rolfe took game one versus Alan Shortledge. Looks like Alan Shortledge playing a, uh, a more Sultai kind of version. This deck here. Yeah, we expected a lot of teamer decks in standard this weekend, and so far, that kind of guess has been correct. But there have been different flavors, of course, in the feature match area. Team of Rolf, Negro, and Wu all currently one win in their column. So some work still needs to be done here for the team on the opposing side of the table. A very traditional-looking... Uh Raymond Up Red deck here from Rolf. Uh, only thing that might be different from uh, what we're used to seeing is uh, the presence of uh, Harsh Mentor in the main deck. Two in play already for Rolf here, along with the Hazard and a Bomat Courier joining the party. Scavenger and a Glint Sleeve Siphoner in play for Short Shortledge. So this matchup is somewhat interesting because, you know, traditionally you would think that it's all about surviving for Alan. If he's able to survive long enough, he'll win because his cards are more powerful. But Hazard the Fervent puts a little bit of a wrench inside of that plan because even if you're able to survive over the course of a long-term game, uh, both the Ramanap Ruins and the Hazard the Fervent 
provide this... And the Bomac career. <laughs> yeah, provide this long-term plan for the red deck. So it's not only super aggressive, but it's also just super resilient in a matchup like this, especially when they're drawing as John Rolf has drawn here. Yeah, Rolf is really putting the screws to Shortledge, who is forced to chump that Hazret with the Glint Sleeve Siphoner, leaving him nothing but the Death Gorge Scavenger in play. Is there anything Shortledge can do to stem this bleeding? I don't know. It seems, seems like he may be out of it at this yeah. point. Yeah, doesn't look good. I'm looking over his, uh, his deck list and... Uh, not many good options here for him. Hostage taker is the play. Targeting the Hazaret. And that's actually a pretty good start. Um, now, if, if Rolf is unable to find a removal spell for this hostage taker, then he could find himself in a really rough spot. Right now, the hostage taker itself He's uh, very good at blocking that hostage taker, or the Harsh Mentor on the other side of the table. Uh, Desk or Scavenger can also trade with the other copy. And then, you know, Alan's not taking quite as much damage as we would have expected. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure enough. As expected. <laughs> Down goes the hostage taker. Back comes Hazaret. Down goes the Death Gorge Scavenger. And 10 is a higher number than 7, <laughs> so it looks like Rolf's going to win this match. Indeed it is. Picking up the first match win for his team, John Rolf, and Ramunap Red. John Rolf went on a pretty nice tear at one point last year. He top eighted like two or three Grand Prix in a row, I think. Oh, really? Yeah. Let's check in here on Legacy. Wu versus O'Higgins, mother of runes, entering play classic card here for Death and Taxes. Insectile Aberration, however, already transformed on the other side of the battlefield for O'Higgins. Mom. <laughs> Is that what you say whenever you tap? Yeah, yeah. Like, I've been I, targeted, I by, I've been targeted yeah. by a removal spell. Mom. Come on. Hitting in for three from the Aberration. For O'Higgins. Only one land in play for Wu. How about we play another Delver? You're really taking advantage of Alan Wu being uh, short on mana. This Vile, though, doing a lot of work now. It's already, you know, provided... One mana for Alan in you know, a weird way via putting that Mother of Runes in play. It's about to put a two drop into play here. Getaxian Probe will give O'Higgins a look at Wu's hand. There you can see a lot of what the deck is trying to do. We've got those Stormforge Mystics and a Batter Skull already in hand. Flicker Wisp as well as a Recruiter of the Guard and an Earthsworn Canonist. You know, uh, Alan Wu really set up this game plan in particular to try to draw a land on the following turn because he wants to be able to use the activated ability of Stoneforge Mystic. Um, had he uh, had he not been trying to make that play, he probably would have main phase put the Ether Sworn Canonist into play. Sure. To uh, force O'Higgins' hand and how he was going to, you know, play over the course of this game. Ponder here for O'Higgins. The Mother of Runes just sitting there on the battlefield. You know, she's so lonely. A nightmare for O'Higgins, whose deck I'm sure, especially after sideboarding, has a lot of spot removal spells in it. Yeah, Mother of Runes, definitely one of the more annoying cards to see on the other other side of the battlefield. All right, we're going to put a Mystic into play here. And there she is, Mom herself, ready with a mug of tea and some protection from any color. <laughs> <laughs> I like the little guy with the quill. He's writing something. Oh, yeah, I never saw him in there before. sitting there. 
This is a player on the team. Team Pokey and Pokey Braun. And there's some song boom. Please come at the blue side. Please come at the blue side. So uh, a team of Delvers over there on uh, Higgins' side of the table. The other two poised to transform if O'Higgins has anything to say about it. Now it's really up to Alan Wu what exactly he wants to do to maximize his chances of winning against this pretty big bug army that O'Higgins is about to assemble. Sure enough. They all flip. Ooh, that's horrifying to imagine coming at you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you find out that your opponent has exquisite firecraft in their hand, a yeah. card that you just really can't interact with. It's, uh, Flicker Wisp would be real, real, real good here, though, for Alan Wu. And um, we do know he has one in hand. Either Vol activation, here's the Wisp. Block and flicker, that's nice. Yeah, and now also... Protection. Uh, some ways, uh, putting Higgins in a situation where you know, he might not even flip this insectile aberration. It's getting uh, flickered. Flicker wisp in and of itself, not unhorrifying. <laughs> <laughs> if it's coming at you in the night. All right, we are going to see the fl Flicker Wisp fall to some of that spot removal you talked about from O'Higgins. All right, we're going to go back over to Table B right now, going over to Table B in Modern, because I do believe this could be the deciding moment here in this match. We can see the counters for Storm have been added to the table. Jacob Negro trying to see if he can go off with Storm once again. We saw it happen last time. Last game with an empty the Warrens for 50 goblins. Ah, smaller empty. Six. Yeah, so. Well. Just what? five goblins. <laughs> It was a mini storm. Yeah, it was yeah, yeah. more of a, just a light. <laughs> it was uh, not quite a bomb cyclone, but. Uh, <laughs> a light rain. Yeah, it was, it was a light rain. Just like the drizzle we had here last night. Chalice of the Void from Seth here. And Chalice of the Void for two is really, 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 really bad for Jacob. Yes. turns off. All of his ritual effects, um, you know, counters the first part of some storm spells. And the other thing that's interesting about it is that it also probably counters any spell that might be capable of getting Chalice of the Void off of the table. Right. And okay. Flicker Wisp, by the way, <laughs> hitting in for three next turn. Jacob Negro at three currently. All right, we've got a removal spell here to deal with that. And you may say to yourself, hey, there was a Chalice of the Voivre 2 in play. How did the Grape Shot kill that? And it turns out the stormed copies do not get countered by the Chalice of the Void because they are not cast. They are simply created by a trigger. That's really interesting. Chalice of the Void, my least favorite card to see on the table in Modern. <laughs> <laughs> As someone who's been known to play Boggles. Serum Visions here for Negro. At one life. Can he make something happen? One is not zero but it's pretty close to it. Yes. With Seth at 19, it's not going to be easy to pull this off. 
All right, and the, meanwhile, Eldrazi Displacer is doing its thing, getting rid of a goblin token a turn. It's funny when that uh, that ability, which has the potential to be so powerful, is being used in this manner and looks awesome. Oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> Another chalice. And oh, there we go. Wow, we were yeah, here. This chalice for one that was countered by the first chalice. <laughs> yeah, Update note. from our legacy table. Alan Wu was able to take it two games to one versus O'Higgins here. So we have our result. The team of Rolf, Negro, and Wu does take this victory here in round four. The unlikely team getting it done. Yeah. It's a... Uh, an amalgam, if you will, of players from different squads. <laughs> but, you know, the, the cool thing about this is that they're building a friendship right now. You know, they're, they're getting closer and closer with each spell they cast while sitting next to each other, these guys. And I'm I like that they're playing it out anyway. Yeah, they're playing it out. Over. Might as well. Came here to play Magic. And these goblins are kind of getting it done right now. For Necro. <laughs> Chalice of the Void has countered a lot of cards. Something that uh, is interesting there is Nagro decided to uh, cast Baral, even though it would be countered by Chalice of the Void, simply to create more storm count so that his Empty the Warrens would make four goblins as opposed to two. Eight goblins remaining here. Yeah, and Jacob Nagro, who was pretty well up against it just a few turns ago, now with eight power in play. Managed to clear off Seth's side of the board. <laughs> I'll path one of your goblins. <laughs> sure. Yeah, and uh, let's put Seth down to a low enough life total where... Jacob wanted to, he could likely finish the game off right here with uh, Pass and Flames. Take a look here, decides what he wants to do. Well, he may only have one bolt in the graveyard, and uh, the front end of Grave Shot does get uh, get countered by the chalice so it would not do quite enough unless it had uh, something to go with it. There it is. Passing flames. All right. Some thoughts on passing flames. If you've, uh, so have you played with Yogmoth's Will at all when playing with the uh, Vintage Cube? No. Have you, yeah, so if you open a Black Lotus, it's like the one of the best cards you can get. And Pass in Flames is, in many ways, Yogmoth's Will. All right, so there you see Jacob Negro didn't have to win, but he did anyway, giving the team of Rolf, Negro, and Wu the W here in round four. And a fun story about them. Didn't expect to be playing together this weekend, but two teams lost some of their teammates due to travel delays, and a new team was formed. And so far, a pretty good day for them. Yeah, I, I like that story. I think I would have liked that story better if it had been three teams who had each <laughs> lost two people and each had, it matched up perfectly. All right, uh, well, uh, <laughs> we'll have more magic for you from round four when we come back after these messages.